I want to thank you for being with us. It's always be, it's good to be together and get to open up God's Word. And you know, this time we have a lot I want to say, so I want to get right uh, into um, our topic. This was um, requested, and uh, I think you'll see it's maybe a, a little bit different topic, but it's important, and, and here's why. Because sooner or later, we've all experienced this close to us. We've all have loved ones that have passed away. We've all been there. But then what? And so that's what I want us to look at uh, and with our time together this time. Then what? After death, what happens after we die? D does the Bible tell us anything about this? And I'm thankful that it does. And what I hope that you come away with is a greater sense of, of what happens when that loved one does draw that that final breath and one day if the lord does not return first each of us will face the same thing we don't know when how old we'll be how it will happen we don't know any of that and i'll tell you i'm kind of glad but it's going to happen and so is this all or is there more i tell you this there's more than meets the eye <laughs> you know we we look at what we can see is flesh and blood. But man is a dual being. Oh, there, there's more to us than, than what you can see. But we are flesh and blood. The Lord took from the dust of the ground and He made man. And sometimes that's what we focus on, isn't it? But our bodies also have a life force within us, as do all living beings. And, and we understand that. We, we know even things as simple like a plant. Sometimes we say, well, the plant's dead. <laughs> There's just no hope for it. It's, it's gone. There's nothing you can do to make it grow again. And then sometimes with a human being, we say, they're, they're gone. They're dead. There's no life force left in them. And now we have all kind of machinery and all that that can measure brain activity and, and electrical impulses. And, and so there is that sense of, of that. But there's also another part of man. And that is we have a spirit. The, the um, animals, they have a life force, but they do not have a spirit. Man is unique in all of God's creation. In that he was made, we are made in the image of God. That is a fascinating thing. That is a very privileged thing, but it makes us different. See, when death occurs, unlike animals and unlike plants unlike anything else we have within us a spirit in fact um, it's alluded to in, in different places but like Zechariah chapter 12 and in verse 1 he talks about that the Lord forms the spirit of man within him see God gives us that spirit I believe he gives us that at conception and so we are unique. And so there's more to us than meets the eye. We've got body and soul. We do have that life force, but that's not our spirit. Now let's think about what death is. Death is the separation of the body and the spirit. When, when they separate, then you're said to be dead. Death is a separation. And so when the soul separates from the body, then we're dead. And, and then our spirit lives separately in a spirit realm. See, this life is not all that there is. We're going to talk about that, that spirit realm. Think about a couple of verses with me. Remember Rachel? Remember uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel? He had Rachel. He had Leah. He had Bella. And uh, now I'm not remembering the other concubine. But he had two wives. His favorite, the one he truly loved, was Rachel. She had two children. At the birth of the youngest, she was struggling. It was difficult. And in fact, it says that she was having Benjamin in Genesis 35 and verse 18. And so it was, as her soul uh, was departing before she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, 
but his father called him Benjamin. So what, what does it say? Her soul was departing. And then parenthesis, for she died. And then there was a time that Elijah had been staying with this widow, and he had miraculously supplied her with food. But then her son got so sick that he died. Oh, she was upset, as you would think she would be. She runs to the man of God, and he goes in 1 Kings 17 and verse 21, And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Notice here again it says the child's soul. Why well, the child's soul needed to come back. It had departed just like Rachel's. And when your soul departs, you die. That is death. So this, this young lad here died. But what does Elijah want to happen? That the soul of the child come back to him. Well, let me ask this. Where did the soul go and from where did it return? Well, we're coming to that. But that's an important question, isn't it? The soul departed. Where did it go? It did not go to extinction, as we'll, we'll notice more here in just a minute. It went somewhere, and from that somewhere, it miraculously came back. That's not the norm. <laughs> we don't normally come back. The Hebrew writer says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. That's the norm, isn't it? The Bible says we have a separation in death, but not extinction. See, the soul departed, but it came back, didn't it? Physical death, again, occurs when the spirit leaves the body. James talks about that. James uses that understanding in a way to explain what a dead faith is like. He says in James 2, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You can't separate the two. If you separate faith and works, you've got a dead faith. If you separate body and spirit, you've got a dead body. You've got a dead person, don't you? That's, that's physical death. Well, spiritual death, what is that? Well, the Bible talks about that. That occurs when we are separated from God. Isaiah said it this way in chapter 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. That's a terrible place to be. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 1, he talks about when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive with Jesus. But we were dead. We were separated from God. That's again the idea of death. It's a separation. I want to go now to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And we're not going to read this passage, but I'm going to, we're going to go over the highlights. We, we've had it read. Now let's, let's go over the highlights of what we're seeing. This is a fascinating account that Jesus is telling us about. Some people look at this, and we know this is the rich man, and this is Lazarus. Was it a parable? That comes up a lot. I tell you, it does not contain the characteristics of a usual parable. For instance, no other parable says, like, like this one does, that there was a certain man, a certain rich man, in verse 19 of Luke 16, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, and he just wanted to eat the crumbs from the rich man's table. And so quite a different lifestyle between the two of them, wasn't it? And let's just say for the sake of argument that it is a parable. I don't think that it is. But let's just say, well, what if it is? A parable is not a fairy tale. A parable uses real-life situations to teach a basic lesson of truth. If it were not true, if the underlying story is not true, it would make no sense. They draw from reality in order to drive home a spiritual point. Sometimes you might have heard a parable defined as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
And so again, the earthly story is based on reality. And so either way, this is a true depiction now of what happens when a good man dies and a bad man dies. What's the difference? There's a lot, isn't it? So let's think about, here, here are the highlights. Both men are said to have died, the rich man and Lazarus. Wherever Lazarus went, the angels were used to transport him there. I've had the sad occasion, but also a special occasion to be with those who, at the moment of death. And, and to those who I felt confident about, I, I, I'm not anybody's judge, but there are some people you just feel confident. They're Christian, and as far as you know, they've been living faithful to the Lord, and they breathe their last breath. What I think is, the angels were just here. Now, we can't see the angels unless they allow it. But the angels took Lazarus and transported him to where he was to go. That, to me, there's great comfort in that. You wonder, oh, what, what's going to happen to me? I draw my last breath. What, what, what's next? Well, I'll tell you what. If you're, if, you're, if you're God's child, the angels will take care of you. Don't worry about it. They'll take you to the right place. Well, the rich man died and he was buried. That's just kind of a sad, matter-of-fact thing. He died and he was buried. The rich man was in Hades. Now, if you have the King James Version, it might say hell. Now, we'll talk about that distinction in a minute. He was being tormented in flames. He lifted up his eyes in torment. The rich man could look across however it's depicted and he could see Lazarus and he could see Abraham and so he knew who Lazarus was and he recognized who Abraham was Abraham referred to the rich man's former existence as your lifetime now he's still alive he's still a living soul a spirit Soul and spirit, by the way, are often used interchangeably. Not always, but often. So he, he is still living, but his lifetime was his time on earth. See, time doesn't matter in eternity. So lifetime is when you're on earth. Abraham made clear their places, their locations were irreversible. Remember what the rich man wanted? He wanted Abraham to send Lazarus to him that, that Lazarus could, could dip his finger in water and just touch the tip of his tongue. He's in agony. He's been tormented in these flames. It's a gruesome picture, isn't it? But isn't it sort of ironic that Lazarus had been just wanting crumbs off the rich man's table? It doesn't sound like he got it. And what does the rich man now want? <laughs> Oh, just a drop of water from the finger of Lazarus. What a change of circumstances, isn't it? But he says, Abraham says, he can't do that. There's a gulf between us, and nobody can cross that gulf. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to leave where Abraham is and cross over to the place of torment, but even if for some reason they did, they can't do it. The rich man's brothers were still occupying the father's house on earth. Life continues on, on earth. You know, we, we pass on. Uh, we, we go to our, our resting place. And life goes on. And so it was with Lazarus' brothers. The law of Moses was still in effect. That's mentioned. So we know kind of the time frame of this. This is not some far off, way off, distant story or some future story. This is in real time. And it's, I believe, some fairly recent occurrence. Now, you notice that, that if somehow the rich man's request had been granted, let, you know, raise Lazarus from the dead, send him to my brothers. I don't want them to come here. Well, it would require Lazarus to return from the dead, which, by the way, he can't do, and, or, and to rise from the dead. You, you've got to cease being dead to come back, right? And there's a gulf fix, and, and 
How are you going to do that? Well, it would take a miracle, wouldn't it? Because that's not the norm at all. You think about some words now, and I, I, I'm trying to lay the groundwork here for what we're about to look at here in just a minute. And so you think about some words. The, the term translated hell in the King James Version is the Greek word Hades. And it's not to be confused with another word, which is a Greek word Gehenna. And I don't like to throw too many words around because, you know, we it's easy to get them mixed up. Gehenna, that word, is found 12 times in the New Testament. And what that's talking about is what probably in our mind when we think about somebody has, is lost and they've gone to hell. That's Gehenna. That is the place of eternal everlasting punishment. The lake of fire where Satan, his angels, and all the wicked people will be placed after the second coming of Jesus and the judgment. So Gehenna is hell. That's the eternal place of the lost. Okay? Hades, on the other hand, that word occurs ten times in the New Testament and always refers to the unseen realm of the dead. The context has to say, is it torment or is it a place of rest? But it refers to the realm of the dead. When we die, we don't go straight to heaven or straight to hell. We go to Hades. And we'll, and we'll see more of that as we go. And so that is the receptacle of disembodied spirits where all people who die await the Lord's return. At that time, our spirits, when the Lord returns, at that time, our spirits will be re reunited with our resurrected bodies. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, when we die, we are through with this body. We have no more use for it. Because Christians, God's people, are going to be given an immortal body. <laughs> One that will never wear out. <laughs> it's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll talk more about that, Lord willing, next time. And so Luke 16 shows us now that Hades contains two regions. One was referred to, that's just where Lazarus went, to the bosom of Abraham. That, that just means he was near with, with Abraham. Uh, the Lord talks about, Jesus talks about in John 1 verse 18, being, being in the bosom of his father. He's just near that closeness uh, to his father. The other region in Hades is described as a tormenting flame. So every occurrence, every time the New Testament refers to Hades, harmonizes with, with this description of this intermediate realm of the dead where the deceased await the resurrection and the judgment. Okay? So let's look at this chart. Now let me, uh, I'm going to try to highlight something here. And uh, hopefully I can get this, I can get this to work. Okay, so notice on, on this side, this is this life. This is our earthly life. People die. Some are saved, most are lost. When the saved die, the Bible describes them as going to a place that is called paradise or the bosom of Abraham, as it's called in Luke chapter 16. We'll see, in our, as we continue our, our thoughts, that you've got Lazarus there. Abraham is there. The thief on the cross is there. We'll notice in just a minute. Jesus is there, temporarily. And then there's a great gulf fixed between the two. Now, when the lost die, they go to the region that involves torment. The word for it in the original language is to Taurus. It is a temporary place of punishment. The rich man, that's where he goes. This, we'll notice that even some sinful angels go there. It's a terrible place of, of flame and torment. And so that, that's the overall picture. Now, 
let's go and look at this in a little bit more detail. Now, you think about this word paradise. Where, where do we hear that? Remember when Jesus was on the cross and he was hanging there between two thieves? They both reviled him at first, remember? And then one of them, I don't know if he came to himself, he, he, he just knew better. And he said, Jesus has done nothing wrong like they had done. He didn't deserve what was happening. And in Luke 23 and verse 43, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So that's where we hear that term, paradise. Now what we're going to see as we continue on is paradise is that part of Hades where is a place of rest. And that's the place where we're waiting for the Lord to come back when all the dead will be raised. And so... We're not talking about extinction, are we? No. Our, our souls go somewhere. Extinction would not be paradise, that's for sure. And we're not talking about the grave. You know, when you die, you're not, you, you are not in that casket inside that vault with dirt covered over you. You are not there. Your body is, but you're not. You've gone to this place the Bible refers to as Hades. Jesus told the thief, you're going to be with me in paradise. Well, they weren't in the tomb together. That's not, it's not talking about the tomb at all, is it? That, sure, that surely would not be paradise. Well, let's go a little bit further. Nor did Jesus, when he died on the cross, he did not go to heaven. He said, well, how do you know that? Well, we know it from John chapter 20 and in verse 17. Mary, after Jesus had been raised from the dead. Mary sees him. Oh, and she just grabs on. Can you imagine her joy? And the Lord says to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. He's, Jesus says, I haven't gone back to the Father yet. So in those three days, between Friday and Sunday... <laughs> Well, where was he? Was it heaven? And so where is this paradise? Where did Jesus and the thief go? Where had he been for those three days? We go to Acts chapter 2 to find the answer. Acts chapter 2. Aren't you glad the Bible tells us these things? And sometimes it's a matter of putting, putting the right things together. But in Acts chapter 2, and our time is just going to get by, so I'm going to kind of sum up some things here. Peter gives the answer to this question. He's preaching the first gospel sermon there on the day of Pentecost, here in Acts chapter 2. He's quoting from Acts chapter, uh, he's quoting from Psalm 16. And he's trying to let them know that this Jesus that they crucified, God has raised him from the dead. But again, where was he? He explains to them. Jesus was in Hades. Let's read a little bit. And so in verse uh, 27, David said, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And he, and he says, um, he's not talking about David. <laughs> He's talking about Jesus. He says in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. David is still in Hades. David is still, in the sense of the word, dead and buried. He has not been resurrected like Jesus has. Jesus is the one that was prophesied in Psalm 16 that God would not leave him in Hades. Hades couldn't hold him. Hold us, could not hold Jesus. And so David's spirit, again, is still there, as, as we read in verse 34. And I tell you, and I wish we had time just to look through all the verses that, that, that make this argument to show us that, no... <laughs> 
Just Acts 2 by itself proves that a person does not go straight to heaven or hell because Jesus, not even Jesus did. He went to Hades, the Bible says. Well, let's, let's keep going. The Lord had already talked about that He'd be in Hades, but it wouldn't hold Him. In Matthew 16, verse 18, the Lord said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So, so there is Jesus here in Hades. He's in paradise, told the thief, Today you will be with me in paradise. But God didn't allow him to stay there. No. In fact, Jesus says the gates of hell, King James Version, the gates of Hades will not prevail against him building his church. Satan thought he had defeated Jesus. He killed, had him killed. But Hades couldn't hold Jesus. As we keep going, again back in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24, notice what Peter's argument continues to be. Whom God raised up, talking about Jesus, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So in other words, though he would die on the cross, Though his body would be placed in the tomb, and though his spirit would, would descend into Hades, nevertheless the gates of Hades would not prevent him from coming back out of Hades, being resurrected from the dead. Not even the gates of Hades could prevent Jesus from doing what he came to do. Now, it was through Jesus' death and his leaving Hades, that Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. We read that in Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 14. In Revelation 1 and verse 18, the Lord said, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus conquered death. Jesus showed us that we will be resurrected. Just like He was resurrected, Hades will not prevent that from happening. Now, quickly, there's another side we, we, we need to mention. And that is, there's that place of torment, isn't it? The Bible pictures that the rich man. That's where he went, lifted up his eyes in torment. The angels, fallen angels, that's where some of them are. I don't know if all of them are there. Because there are still those ministering spirits of Satan, <laughs> of his. But Second Peter 2 and verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them in, down to hell, and again, that's Hades, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And, and so we have um, uh, somebody else, you might say. There in Hades. Jude alludes, I think, to the same thing in Jude in verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Until the judgment of the great day, Hades remains intact. The angels, those fallen angels, that's where they are. And on the torment side, to Taurus. All the saints who have died in all eternity are in the paradise part of the Hadean world of Hades, waiting for the Lord to come back. And so here's kind of drawing, bringing things to a, to a conclusion. Notice Revelation 20 and verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So there is a time coming when all who were in Hades are it's going to be emptied out. When on the day of judgment, when the Lord comes back. That's what I want us to talk about next time. Everybody who ever lived. 
would be there. But now it brings up some interesting questions, and I want us to examine this together next time. Give thanks to the Father in all.